Hi, welcome to the Carmen Brangé Show. I am Carmen Brangé. Today we're going to check out a video featuring Paul Fitz. It's an oldie but a goodie. Let's check it out. Welcome to the Kerman Branje Show. As you can see, we've got some new technology, some green screen technology. So I wanted to use it. So we're the format of today's show is going to be a little bit different. We're going to check out a video today, and I'm going to give my commentary. I think the kids call that a reaction video. So we're going to check out this video. It's pretty old. I dug it up out of the archives. Uh, it's a video that uh, features Paul Fitz. Paul Fitz is a pretty somewhat famous researcher, uh, famous for something called Fitz Law, actually. And if you're involved in design and user experience design or inter interaction design, especially, human factors engineering maybe, you've heard of Paul Fitz and you've heard of Fitz's Law. So Fitz's Law is a, uh, a law that Fitz discovered that uh, shows that there's a relation between the size of a target that you're trying to get to, the distance that target is from your starting point, and the time it takes for you to get there, which which kind of makes intuitive sense. So I, I can show you really quickly what that looks like. Uh, that's Fitz's law right there. Let me just get myself out of the way here really quick. Yoop. So that's Fitz's law. So time T to move your hand to a target of size S at distance D is uh, determined by this. So in layman, in English, that mean that that says that the si the time it takes you to get your finger or a pointer from a starting point to a new a target, let's say, is a f is dictated by the distance the target is away and the size of the target, which makes sense. If you had a big ass target and your finger was right beside it, you could just go like that, no problem. But if you have a teeny tiny square and uh, a couple feet for you to move, you're gonna have to be more, it's gonna have to be a slower movement. Your speed is gonna be slower, right? So that's one, just one of the things that Fitz, Paul Fitz is famous for. Uh, he did a lot of work. As you'll see, he's kind of in this video, he's kind of explaining his work. He did a lot of work in something called human factors engineering, which is somewhat of a precursor to user experience design. Um, now, the reason that I wanted to show you this video is because I think it's a really good example of how people tend to give labels or names to things that have been going on or occurring for a long, long time before, either under no name or under a different name. And, and I think user experience design is one of those things. So you might think, so Don Norman coined the term user experience design in the 90s sometime, late 90s, let's say. Um, but I don't think that's when user experience design, the pra the people doing what it what it is user experience design, that's not really when that started. Um, I'm So I, I've lectured before about the history of user experience design. I've argued it goes back to the ancient Greeks. Uh, I have this really big quote out of uh, a book from Hippocrates, and he's talking about hospitals essentially and from a ver from a human factors ergonomics perspective right he's saying oh the <clears throat> the surgeon should be positioned this way opposite of the patient and the tool should be on this side and the, the patient should be oriented this way and it's very much user experience design user uh, human factors engineering ergonomics whatever you want to call it, it is the application of science to understanding how best to interface human beings and technology. 
Uh, so that's sort of called that's called user experience design right now. But as you'll see in this video, it's a very old black and white video where they kind of talk uh, with that, uh, what do you call that? A transatlantic accent. Uh, and they use gendered language, so please bear with me. It's a video from 49 or 50, uh, and they say he and, and they use man a lot. So uh, what are you gonna do? It's an old video. So please just uh, ignore that. Um, so let's get to the video. Why not? Um, do, 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 do. Hope you enjoy it. I'm just going to... Oh, don't want to put myself out of there. I'm just going to shrink myself down a little bit. So you can see. Okay, here we go. From the moment of his birth, man is involved with machines. Machines can prolong life and then end it abruptly. So it's important, you know, sorry to see you, you know, had to witness a plane crash and stuff, but it's, it's important to understand that human factors, engineering, user experience, design has life and death consequences, right? When, when you're flying planes, driving cars, right? Kim Vicente in his book, The Human Factor states that there's about a plane crash full of people so three to four hundred people die every week in the united states from preventable medical errors right so people getting the wrong drugs people just errors being made and people end up dying because of that uh so it's life and death okay let's keep going men and machines the systematic effort to make their relationship as safe and efficient as possible in a world that grows ever more complex is one of the newest branches of psychology. It also seems destined to be one of the most important. Now that's even, the world is getting more and more complex even today, a hundred times of what it was then. So even back then they were realizing, oh shoot, we're getting a lot of technology here. We need to think what's the best way to interface with people. And of course that's even more important today. This field of psychology is known as human engineering and its pioneers are the engineering psychologists. So engineering psychologists, human factors, human factor engineer, human factors engineers, uh, essentially what they are is they've studied psychology, they've studied engineering, and they are interested in the intersection between the human being and the machine. I'm John Darley. I'm in the control tower at the Idlewild Airport. About 250,000 years ago, man picked up a stone and made an axe like this one. For the next quarter of a million years, not very much happened. At least not from the standpoint of engineering psychology. Because man continued to work with very simple tools. But since the Industrial Revolution, things have picked up quite a bit. Here, for example, at this busy airfield, we can see how far and how fast we've come. When machines get this kind So human factors engineering essentially started in the cockpit, right? In, the, in studying uh, controls in airplanes. So that's why, uh, that's why we're in an airport right now. Okay, but how does man cope with it? It has become the job of the engineering psychologist to find out. The study of man's behavior is the province of psychology. And in today's world, our behavior is very much linked to the machines. In the home, on the roads, at work, we are almost never without a machine of some kind. Therefore, it has become... Right, and again, that's even more like this thing here doesn't go... I don't go too far without that thing in my hand, right? So that, I, I think that's why user experience design, it's a, it's a new term now, and, and people, lots and lots of people have jobs. I'm fairly certain back in this time... There's a few dozen people doing this kind of stuff. Uh, now it's clearly tens and tens of thousands. And it's because, yeah, what this guy was saying is is continued on for six years. I'm the responsibility of engineering psychologists to study man's behavior with his friend and enemy, the machine. 
During and after World War II, many psychologists tackle this increasingly complex relationship. Kennedy, Taylor, Morgan, Ness, Kapoff, in England, Bartlett, so, and Brock I'm not sure what the Taylor, who, which Taylor he's referring to in that instance, but just to reiterate the fact about people doing user experience design or that practice, right, before it was called that, bef way in the past. So Frederick Taylor, again, not sure if that's the Taylor he's talking about, but there, again, I, I've sort of looked at, at a history of UX and I kind of consider Frederick Taylor to be in there because, so Frederick Taylor is a father of scientific management where he was trying to apply science to the pr practice of management. And he'd do things like timing studies where he'd have people shovel dirt and see which shape of shovel resulted in the fastest, quickest dirt moving activities. So again, he was doing that in the 1850s before, and that's certainly, 1850 was certainly before 1998. Among others. One of the pioneers is Dr. Paul M. Phipps of the University of Michigan. Engineering psychology thinks of man's relation to machine as a kind of dialogue in which the man and machine exchange information. So I think this is inter this is the first time this has come up. He mentions this a, a lot. Dialogue, right? That that's sort of a thing. I think a lot of user experience designers right now think that's a new and novel thing. Oh, the interface is a, is dialogue between the user and the computer. You're right. It was, and it is, and folks like Paul Fitz realized that about 60 years, no, 70 years ago. sometimes breaks down. For example, the housewife, in setting the control on her oven, uh, sometimes sets it too high so that the roast burns. Or the driver, reaching to turn off the windshield wiper, uh, turns off the headlights instead. Engineering psychologists attempt to eliminate such confusion, not by changing man's habits, but by changing the machine, they attempt to discover how... Okay, pause here quick. So this is a key, key, key aspect. It's a, it's a major shift in, the, in attitudes, and I think this is, this is where empathy has... A, empathy, in, at least in the framework of design, experience design, right? So what he's saying is the human being is fine. We're not going to change the human being. Uh, we're going to change the machine instead to match the human being, right? So instead of trying to insist on uh, behavior changes, which are difficult and hard to create, like it's hard to get people to change their behavior, hard or impossible, we're going to forget about that, accept the human being as they are, and change the machine to match them. It's a, This is a key attitude change. Machines can be designed so that the machine will speak a language which man understands. This means, I believe, that we should study man's habits, determine his natural reactions to uh, stimuli, do experiments such as this simple stimulus response compatibility study. Can you hear me all right? Yes. This time we're going to test your speed and accuracy of so response to signals. In this case, just the center light will come on, and when you see that light, you are to respond just as quickly as you can. All right, are you ready? Your reaction time was 0.17. Your movement time was 0.11. You reset the clock. This time we're going to make it a bit more complicated. Instead of just the center light coming on, any one of the nine lights may appear. Your task again is to put your finger on the button as quickly as you see the light. All right, are you ready? Your reaction time was 0.33. Your movement time was 0.18. As you can see, man does best when there are no alternatives. When we increase the number of alternatives in this experiment, man's reactions increase by about 50%. But the task is still a highly compatible one. That is, man's reactions are very natural ones, and he practically never makes an error. Let's see now what So happens. what he's talking about here, this is what people are referring to when they're talking about intuitive. When something is intuitive, when an interface is intuitive, it means you don't need to think about it. You don't need uh, another two, three, four, five seconds of cognition or thinking in order to do the thing. Uh, so for example, Don Norman talks about doors a lot, his Norman door, where there's, 
You know, in offices, a lot of offices, they have glass doors with two bars on either side. That's not intuitive, at least on one side, because uh, both bars are telling you to pull, right? If you had a flat panel that you could push on, that's intuitive. You don't have to think about that, right? But if there's two bars, you need to think, remember, right? Oh, which way did it open or read? That takes a second or two to read and then think what the words mean. That's not intuitive, right? Intuitive means when it's natural and you just do it without thinking. That's what he's referring to is when you introduce either mapping or encoding and your brain has to do some thinking, the task is going to be harder and you're going to make more errors. Fun when we separate the stimulus and the response and man must control from a distance as is often the case in the man-machine dialogue. All right, this time we have a more complicated task. The signal will appear on this panel up here and you are to respond as before on these buttons down here. Again, touch the light as, touch the appropriate button as soon as the light comes on. Are you ready? Okay. Your reaction time was 0.6. Three, your movement time was 0.17. The biggest source of confusion in man-machine communication arises when the brain has to translate and interpret information. The next step in our experiment is of this sort. The experimenter rotates the display so that it appears to be seen upside down and in a mirror. We so now there's a, your brain needs to do a mapping, right? It needs to say, oh, over actually top left equals bottom right. To do that translation every time takes time. Sometimes it, your brain doesn't do the translation right, so it takes longer and there's more errors. Time, and now may be longer than a second. And you will notice that the subject's movements are uncertain and sometimes made to the wrong target. Uh, he can no longer use natural reactions in responding to the stimulus lights. Each step in which we have reduced the compatibility between man and machine has resulted in a fractional increase in the subject's reaction time. At first, this uh, increase of fractions of a second may seem trivial until one considers that a machine such as an airplane flies hundreds of feet uh, in a city is a matter of life and death. Uh, lack of compatibility means that the pilot makes errors his reaction time slows down. This is exactly what was happening to some of our pilots in World War II when engineering psychology first got started in this country. As a matter of fact, it started right here in the cockpits of our planes. We had the cream of American youth preparing for air combat. And yet about one in every hundred was being killed in a training accident. job to find out. Pilots error. Most of these accidents were called on the reports. Mm. But we engineering psychologists thought differently. We talked to the pilots and they called it engineering design error. Pilots error, hell. That's an engineering error. He had half a second to flip over to his reserve tank and it takes three. Try it once and see. I can see how it happened. So this is really interesting. I think this is um, maybe not the beginnings of but certainly an example of people, designers, bringing empathy in, right? Trying to understand from their perspective. And it, I mean, in this case, they're asking the users to do something that's physically impossible, right? There's an action that the laws of physics dictates takes a certain amount of time. Uh, the design requires it in less time. That's not, that's going to be frustrating and possibly kill you in a plane like this, right? So it's interesting. This is really, I, I think, where our, maybe this empathy in designing for humans really started to, to take hold and people started to get serious about it. The two levers are exactly alike. In an emergency, you don't have time to look, you just grab. Everybody that flies that aircraft has trouble. They feel for one knob and grab another. They've never flown the plane before. The whole instrument panel is different. You look around for the airspeed indicator and it's someplace else. All right, so if, you, if controls aren't intuitive, right, which we talked about intuitive means you don't have to think about it so if they're not intuitive means you do have to think about it if you're in a fighter plane or a bomb and 
not only is flying a plane a difficult thing to do, but there's other planes flying near you that are trying to kill you. Obviously, you won't be able to think, right? I mean, just you have the slightest bit of empathy. So if you require even the tiniest bit of thinking in that situation, and it's not all very intuitive, you're going to make errors, obviously. Yes, play it was not the pilot. Then what was it? We started with the instrument panel. Every indicator on it is important to a pilot, but six of them are vital. These are the six. They tell the pilot his position and his rates of movement in three-dimensional space. But there was no standard arrangement, and so each time a pilot flew a different type of aircraft, he had to learn a new arrangement of the instruments. In order to find Right, a couple things there. So consistency and standards, one of Nielsen's heuristics. They didn't have any standards. Every time a pilot gets into a, into a different plane... It's a whole new setup. Of course, you're going to be making errors, right? Also, this is a really good, this is design research. This is exploratory research, right? They're going out, they're interviewing pilots. Hey, what are, of all these controls, what couldn't you live without? What are their six most important ones? You know, you go and interview pilots and see what they tell you. And they listened. Oh, these are the six? Okay, we're going to focus on these. What arrangement with short and eye movements, reduce decision time, and save lives? We photographed, measured, and timed actual eye movement patterns of pilots in flight. I mean, that that's amazing. That They were doing eye tracking studies. I imagine before eye trackers, I don't know how they, I guess they would just look and kind of see where they're looking by looking back through video, but that's incredible. Eye As a next step, we converted all the data to schematic drawings, compared them, and found that one arrangement required the least amount of eye movements and was clearly superior to all the rest. Today, this arrangement is standard in all so, military... So, I mean, this is design thinking, right? And, you know, another thing uh, that people have been doing for a long time, and it's just gotten a new name now. Um, so, they, you know, they empathized, they ideated, they prototyped, right? They built all, all the different configurations. They tested. They, you know, they iterated... That's design thinking. These black and white people were doing design thinking back in, in the fifties. Most civilian aircraft, and the pilots like it. They call it the sacred six. But one of the six was not so sacred. The standard altimeter. Right. This is how what could you know that without doing interviews? You, Fitz did interviews with his pilots. If he knows that, because that probably came up a lot. The sacred six, sacred six, sacred six. How would you know that as an engineer? That's probably that's pilot talk. Pilot formally had to read to find out his altitude. Three pointers, the long one for hundreds of feet, the broad one for thousands of feet, the small one for ten thousands of feet. At the moment, this one reads 1,500 feet. In a power dive, this is what the pilot sees on his altimeter. Can he read it? Working under Dr. Walter F. Grafter, Engineering psychologist at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base took the altimeter into the laboratory. We'll start you off in level flight due south at 20,000 feet. I'll call off course and altitude changes. Whenever the bell rings, you read your altitude. Are you ready? Roger. Okay, bank to the right to 225 degrees and then climb to 30,000 feet. Roger. Twenty-three thousand five hundred. Error. The psychologist knows the correct reading because he has arranged for the bell to ring only at certain predetermined altitudes. Twenty-eight thousand nine hundred. Error. So imagine you're in a giant bomber. It's freezing cold. It's night. People are shooting at you. You are possibly crashing, and then you're expected to read this little dial doohickey thing. Level out, and then put it into a dive. 20, 26, uh, no, 22,000. 18, no, no, it's, uh, uh. Okay, level out. Pretty tough, isn't it? Engineering psychologists 
found that the average pilot took seven seconds to read all three pointers of the conventional altimeter in the laboratory. In the air, of course, where the pilot usually knows his approximate Seven altitude. seconds, that's a long time. One, two, three, four. Like that. So it's three more seconds than that. That's That seems long. His reading is considerably faster. In the laboratory, his readings also were frequently in error by a thousand feet or more. And they were usually wrong in the dangerous direction. That is, the pilot thought he was higher than he actually was. It looked as if we had the answer to many mountaintop crashes and crashes short of the field. Our problem was clear, to find a better way. So, again, this kind of work is life-saving, right? Uh, they probably, there's a reason why flying is one of the safest things, one of the safest ways of traveling. It's because people like Paul Fitz have gone through with an empathetic, uh, approach and, and went and eliminated all the sources of error, right? And, and didn't take this blaming approach on humans, right? Just looked at it as an engineer and a psychologist with empathy and they are saving lives. Displaying altitude information. And as we studied the altitude display, we found out more about what the pilot needs to know. This counter, for instance, was easy to read with speed and accuracy. It told the pilot exactly where he was, but it didn't tell him where he'd been, where he was going to be, or how fast his altitude was changing. The search continued in all Nine altimeter displays were tested. Again, that sounds like test. Uh, uh, that sounds like uh, design thinking to me. Empathy, uh, ideate, prototype, test, right? And iterative, iterative. They iterate on it on on a bunch of uh, on a bunch of designs. That's design thinking. We want to try out this new tape type altimeter. I'll start you out in level flight at 30,000 feet. As soon as you're ready, put the nose down and then level out at 10,000 feet. When the bell rings, call out your altitude. Roger. 28,000. Twenty thousand nine hundred. Fifteen thousand. Ten angels on the nose. This thing really works. Engineering psychologists found out which designs worked best for man. Design engineers built it. Today, the most modern Air Force planes are equipped with a tape altimeter. It is also available for commercial planes and private pilots. These studies solved some of the problems for our pilots, but other problems remain. It is not only essential that the machine speak clearly to the man, the man must speak just as clearly to the machine. See more communication talk. It's, uh, it's a dialogue between the human being and the man. Right, and the, the right and the response machine. is a matter of life and death. Here's a scene that has been repeated far too often. When he touched the runway, the pilot started to raise his flaps. Instead, he raised his landing gear. In certain types of aircraft, this accident was tragically frequent. Who was to blame, the man or the machine? The answer again is the machine. And here is the culprit. Identical control knobs placed side by side, but controlling very different functions. The pilot touching down at 100 miles an hour doesn't have time to take his eyes off the runway. And yet right. also it's not intuitive. You need to think because they're both the same. You have to mem you have to remember, you have to recall that memory and you're going to make an error when you recall that or, you know, just grab for the wrong thing. Right? It has to be more intuitive. Like I would make those two controls separate um altogether, like not a lever. One would make might be a lever, one might be a button or something. Totally different with levers having the same shape knob placed a few inches apart it's very easy for him to grasp the wrong one without visual cues what shapes can a man most easily distinguish by feel alone 
That was one of the next problems tackled by the engineering psychologists right. at Wright. More prototyping, more testing. Uh, we want to find out whether you can tell the difference among these knobs if you can't see them. Uh, you can put your blindfold down now and we'll position your hand out here. When I say go, I want you to put your hand down on the knob that is positioned directly under it. Right. And when I say stop, I want you to take your hand up. Right. Then after each pair, I want you to tell me whether they were the same or different. All right. Go. Stop. Oh, so they even have, gl you know, gloves. Because in a real plane, it's going to be freezing cold. They're going to be wearing gloves. So you got to test it like it would be in the real, in the real world. Go. Stop. Those were the same. Go. Stop. Go. Stop. Those were the same. Go. Stop. Go. Stop. Those were different. As a result of our experiments, we recommended that each control have a different knob shape easily identified by touch. And here are some of the shapes that we recommended easily identified by feel without the necessity of using vision. When these shapes were introduced into airplanes, many of the landing accidents were reduced. These experiments, which we have been describing, were some of the early experiments done by the engineering psychologists. In the last 10 years, machines have continued to grow more complicated and the work of the engineering psychologists more difficult. Helping man to stay ahead. Okay, we're gonna stop there. Um, so I think a couple things are clear from that video. So number one is things like design thinking, things like user experience design, things like user-centered design, things like usability testing, things like empathy and design are not new, right? Um, they might be more popular now, more widespread, more widely used in industry, for example, uh, but they're, they're not brand new. They're at least, like we saw from this video, 60, 70 years old. People have been doing this stuff for a while. So I hope um, you understand, you know, get to know Paul Fitz a little bit. You've, you've probably heard of Fitz's Law, and now you kind of get to put a face to a name. Uh, I'd invite you to check out some of his other work too. He's got a lot of papers, and again, you can learn a lot of techniques, right? A lot of things like A-B testing. Uh, that's not, again, not new. It's not a new thing. People were doing that back in the 50s. Um, anyways, I hope you enjoyed uh, the Paul Fitz video and this new format. I think we're going to be doing much more of this in the future, perhaps. Uh, I don't know. We'll see how this format works and how my new how my new tech plays out. Um, other than that, I, <clears throat> I will see you at the next episode of the Carmen Branje Show. See you later.